Uh, um, I have no idea. Why did Jesus die? Jesus, I should really know this. Big question for early in the morning, isn't it? Jesus died for people, other people. He's saving us. Was it Pontius Pilate probably got a bit jealous of Jesus getting all the birds, so... We all die. People die for different reasons. Uh, to, well, it, I think it was supposed to be like for our sins, wasn't it? Jesus died because people didn't agree with him. Well, probably fear is why he died more than anything else. Didn't he, like, sacrifice himself on the cross? So, it was his choice. Jesus died because of people's beliefs. That's up for discussion. Everybody dies. No one lives forever. You are loved. That's the message at the heart of the New Testament, and that's the message at the heart of this universe. Our daughter Bex is married to a guy called Miles. He's a rapper, he's a great guy, um, and he has a tattoo of a cross on his back. And I asked his permission to take a photograph of it, and he was delighted for me to take the photograph, <laughs> and he was particularly thrilled with the definition on his shoulder muscle. The cross is the symbol of Christianity. It's like, kind of like the logo of Christianity. And in this picture, there's a clue to why Jesus died and to why it's become the symbol of Christianity. When I was in my first year at university, I arrived. I was a, an atheist. Neither of my parents were churchgoers. And it was through reading this, through reading the New Testament, that I had an encounter with Jesus. And then I discovered this. I'd heard sort of in RE lessons and things about the fact that Jesus died for the sin of the whole world. And it didn't really mean anything to me. But then I discovered this, and this blew my mind. There's a verse in the New Testament where Paul says this, the Son of God, that is Jesus, loved me and gave himself for me. It's as personal as that. If you had been the only person in the world, Jesus would have died for you. He loves you that much. And that understanding completely changed my life. It changed my relationships. It's changed our marriage. It's changed our family. It's changed our friendship. And that's what I want to talk about tonight. Why does that change everything in life when we grasp that and experience it? The Son of God loved me. This is God's love for you. God loves you so much. His love for you, it's unconditional. It's wholehearted. It's continual. And I don't know what you think of when you think of the greatest love that you can imagine. Maybe it's a, a boyfriend, girlfriend, husband, wife, parent, child. That's why I say there's a clue in that picture of Miles. He's got the tattoo of a cross on his back, and he's got his baby in his arms, held, loved. That's the reason for the cross. It's God's amazing love for you, for me. So, but why? why? Why would that be necessary? What's the problem? Well, you are created in the image of God. That means you are a, a masterpiece. There's something amazing about every human being. Something noble, something beautiful, something magnificent. Human beings are, are capable of... of such extraordinary creativity because they're created in the image of God and God is creative. They can produce great music, art, literature. Human beings are, are capable of great self-sacrifice, devotion, kindness. But there's also another side to the coin. 
we are also capable of bad stuff. And you have to open the newspaper, look at the news. There are some terrible things going on around the world. There's evil going on around the world. But the world is more complex than just saying, well, those are evil people and these are the good people. Because it's more mixed. People who are capable of great love and devotion and kindness can also do some bad stuff. I've done some stuff in my life that I deeply regret. I've hurt some people. I've even hurt people that I love. And the Apostle Paul puts it like this. He says, all of us have sinned. Sin. Sin, that's kind of a a word that's changed meaning in our culture. Sin like, has almost become like a good word. It, it's so good, it's sinful. It's an advert for ice cream. So, but sin in, in the Bible is the bad stuff. And Paul says, all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. What does that mean? Well, all of us have sinned. I personally find it so hard to admit I do anything wrong. Those words, I am sorry, they just won't come out. I find it, if I do something wrong, I just think it's got to be someone else's fault. I blame someone, I usually blame my wife. It's her fault. And we look around to make excuses. I was amused to see some of the things people have written on their accident claim forms when they, they, they're, they're trying to explain to their insurance company why they had the accident. One man wrote this. Going home, I drove into the wrong house and collided with a tree that wasn't there. <laughs> Another man wrote this. The other car collided with mine without giving warning of his intention. <laughs> Another person wrote this. The guy was all over the road. I had to swerve a number of times before I hit him. <laughs> Someone else wrote this. I've been driving my car for 40 years when I fell asleep at the wheel and had an accident. Someone else wrote this, the pedestrian had no idea which way to go, so I ran over him. <laughs> and finally this, I pulled away from the side of the road, glanced at my mother-in-law, and headed over the embankment. <laughs> but I think if we're honest, we've all done stuff that we know is wrong. And Paul says, all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. John Collins was the vicar here before Sandy, and he's now 90 years of age. He's a very holy, uh, amazing man. Very gracious, very loving, very kind, very humble man. Also a great gift of explaining the Bible. And sometimes a, a rather arrogant young guy would come to him and say, you know, I have no need of God, I, I lead a good life. So John would use this illustration. He says, supposing there's a scale here on this pillar of all the people who've ever lived. Who would you put at the top? And they'd say, well, maybe Mother Teresa, or their mother would go at the top. And he'd say, well, who would you put at the bottom? And they'd say, well, maybe Adolf Hitler, or their boss would go at the bottom. <laughs> and then John would say, well, I think you agree, well, all of us are somewhere between there and there. And John, being a very humble man, would say, I'm, I'm probably somewhere down there, and you're probably somewhere up there. And the guy would nod and say, yeah, that's probably the case. <laughs> <laughs> and then John said, well, what do you think the standard is? And the guy said, well, maybe the standard's the ceiling. And John would say, no, look at the verse. The standard's not the ceiling, it's the sky. All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. The glory of God was revealed in Jesus. And compared to him, we all fall a very long way short. So you might say, well, if that's the case, we're all in the same boat, why does it matter? It matters according to the New Testament for, for these reasons. And I, I put them in the four piece to make them easier to remember. First of all, the pollution of sin. The things we do wrong spoil our lives. It, it's like it, the pollution of the environment is a big problem at the moment. But it, Jesus says it's possible to pollute your soul. The stuff that we do wrong can spoil our relationships. And then there's the power of sin. The bad stuff in our life the bad habits, they're very addictive. Jesus says, whoever sins is a slave of sin. When our eldest son was uh, working in London and living with us, 
he's got a very sweet tooth, and one time he came, came home with a, a tray of Krispy Kreme donuts. He has 16 Krispy Kreme donuts. And I thought, I'm going to try one of these. And I actually only ate half of it, and I felt physically sick. And I said to him, yeah, I just tried one of these, and I felt physically sick. He said, yeah, they do make you feel a bit ill. <laughs> but you kind of feel the only thing that might make you feel better is to eat another one. <laughs> and I thought, that is a great definition of addiction. It's the stuff we do that we kind of makes us feel terrible, but we feel the only way to feel better is to do it again. And then uh, third P is the, the penalty of sin. There's something within us that cries out for justice. When we see these kind of horrific things that are going on around the world, we say, that ought not to happen. They should be stopped. They should be brought to justice. But personally speaking, I have a very different standard for other people than I have for myself. Let me give you a trivial example. For, for years, I've, I biked in here from Clapham, and uh, there's a, a bike and bus lane which is wonderful because morning it was always very, very uh, huge amount of traffic and it would take about 45 minutes in a car, 15 minutes on a bike. And I would sail past all the traffic uh, and I loved it. Occasionally, cars would come into the bike lane, the bus and bike lane, and it would infuriate me. These wretched cars, what were they doing in this lane? And I happened to know there was a police trap and I think, I hope they get caught. So irritating. Sometimes it would rain, and it wasn't convenient to come in by bike, and I'd come in by car. And I'd look at these two lanes, then this, this lane with all these cars, and a completely empty bus and bike lane. I mean, why have a completely empty bus and bike lane? So I'd nip into the bus and bike lane, whiz down it in the car, and cut in just before the police trap. And I thought that was fine for me to do it. After all, it did say buses and cyclists, and I am a cyclist. <laughs> The point is, I have a totally different standard for myself than for everybody else in the world. In other words, I'm a hypocrite. And what St. Paul says is this. He says, you therefore have no excuse when you pass judgment on someone else, for at whatever point you judge the other, you are condemning yourself, because you who pass judgment do the same things. And for me, it's not just biking, it's a whole lot of other things as well. And then, for me, it's the partition of sin. Yeah, it is. When we have offended someone, or someone has offended us, we don't want to look them in the eye. We try and avoid them, because something's come between us. And what the New Testament says is, the stuff that we do wrong, it's caused a partition between us and God. That's, if you like, the bad news. But the good news is this. This is the solution. God loves you. The Son of God loved me and gave himself for me. God has come to this earth in the person of his Son to do something about it, to die for you and to die for me. The Apostle Peter put it like, like this. He said, he himself, that is Jesus, bore our sins, that's your sins and my sins, in his body on the tree, on the cross. By his wounds, you have been healed. If you like, you, you, it's been described as like the self-substitution of God. God substituted himself for you. What does that mean? In July 1941, a prisoner escaped from Auschwitz. And as a reprisal, the Gestapo selected 10 men arbitrarily to die in a starvation bunker. And one of the men selected, his name was Francis Gajewniczek. And when he was selected, he cried out, he said, oh, he said, my poor wife and my children, they'll never see me again. And at that moment, a little guy, Polish man in glasses, wire frames, stepped out of line, he took off his cap, and he said, he said, look, I'm a Catholic priest, so I don't have a wife or children. He said, I would like to die instead of that man. To everyone's amazement, his offer was accepted, and he was taken to the starvation bunker, and on the 
14th of August, he was the last one to die. He, he had a, an amazing atmosphere, apparently. They got them singing hymns and praying. Uh, but on the 14th of August, they needed the bunker for other people, and they gave him a lethal injection of carbolic acid, and that's how he died. 41 years later, his death was put in its proper perspective. There, in a crowd of 150,000 people, 26 cardinals, 300 archbishops and bishops, St. Peter's Square, Rome, in that crowd was Francis Gavnicic. And the Pope said on that occasion about his death, he said, the death of Maximilian Kolbe, that Polish 47-year-old priest who stepped forward to give his life, he said that was a victory like the one won by our Lord Jesus Christ because he gave himself he gave up his life out of love. I happened to see the obituary of Francis Guy of Nietzsche, who died at the age of 93. He spent the rest of his life going around telling everybody about the love of this man who died in his place. And in an even more amazing and wonderful way, Jesus died in your place. In my place, the Son of God loved me and gave himself for me. The cross was the, the height of pain, depth of shame. And yet, the New Testament never concentrates on the physical suffering of Jesus. Because other people have suffered crucifixion. Even today, people are being crucified. What it focuses on is what was unique about Jesus' death. And that is that he was suffering spiritually because he was bearing on himself your sin and my sin, our guilt, our shame. I, I, I found that so hard to understand. And then I saw someone explain it like this. There's a verse in the Old Testament which prophesied the death of Jesus. And it goes like this. We all like sheep have gone astray. We've turned everyone to our own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. And I heard a man called David McInnes explaining it like this. He said, let this hand represent you and me. And let this book represent the bad stuff. The stuff that we do that separates us from God. All we like sheep have gone astray. We've turned everyone to our own way. Let this hand represent Jesus. Jesus never did anything wrong. There was nothing between him and his father. And what the verse says is, on the cross, the Lord has lain on Jesus the iniquity of us all. He was bearing my sin, my guilt, my shame on the cross. And then David said, do you see where that leaves you? And I looked, and I could see it left me free to have a relationship with God. The cross, the results of the cross, it, it, the cross and resurrection are really like one event. And it's like a beautiful diamond. You can look at it from so many different facets, all the different things that the death of Jesus achieved. God revealed how much he loves you. Guilt is, is feeling bad about the stuff we do. Shame is feeling bad about who we are. And Jesus bore our guilt and our shame. And you never need to feel bad about yourself in that sense because you are loved. Your worth is what you're worth to God. What are you worth to God? Jesus died for you. You are so infinitely valuable to God. And then Jesus revealed what, what true love is. True love is not just a feeling. Love involves more than words. It involves actions. And Jesus showed us the supreme example of love by sacrificing himself for you and for me. He also, the answer to suffering is very complex. Why does God allow suffering? The, Theologians, philosophers have struggled for 2,000 years. And no one's got to come out with a complete answer. But what the cross tells us is this. 
God is not sitting in a deck chair in heaven watching all the suffering down here. No, he has come into our world to suffer for us, and he now suffers alongside of us. And then it tells us this, that evil has been defeated. The powers of evil have been defeated on the cross. And that there's going to be a good ending. The resurrection was not the reversal of a defeat. It was the manifestation of a victory. And it tells us that the story ends well. And then those four Ps we looked at, they have been reversed. And I'm going to take them in the opposite uh, way to the, to the way that we looked at them. First one, the partition has been removed. You can come home. What St. Paul says is that God was in Christ reconciling the world, that is you and me, to himself. The cross was not God sort of punishing an innocent third party. That would be barbaric. No, God was in Christ. God himself came to die for you and for me. God was in Christ reconciling you and me to himself. Reconciliation is amazing. I love this sculpture that Charlie Maxey did of the prodigal son. That's what Jesus made possible. That is the loving father welcoming you and me back, hugging us, holding us, loving us. That's reconciliation. And reconciliation with God leads to reconciliation in marriage, in relationships between parents and children, in friendships. And then the penalty has been paid. The guilt has been removed. There's no condemnation. The word that's used is justified. Justified means just as if I'd never sinned. It's a term from the law court. If you were justified, you were acquitted. I, I really found it difficult to understand how Jesus' death could really make a difference to me today. Someone used this uh, analogy, and it really helped me. It's a, not a true story, but it's just an, a, an analogy. So there were two friends. Friends at school, friends at university. And when they left, they went their separate ways. One became a lawyer, was very successful, became a judge. The other one went into a life of crime. And one day, the criminal appeared before his old friend, the judge. And the judge had a dilemma. What was he to do? He loved this friend who pleaded guilty to the crime because he'd done it. But he couldn't just let him off because he was a judge. He had to be just. That's God's dilemma, if you like. God is a God of justice. If there was no justice in the world, the world would be a terrible place. But he also loves you. So this is what the judge did. He fined his, his friend the appropriate penalty. Let's say 20,000 pounds. That was justice. Then he took off his robes. He went round to see his friend. And he wrote out a check for 20,000 pounds and gave it to his friends. That was love. And what Jesus has done is even more amazing. Because the cost was not just 20,000 pounds. It was his death on the cross. We were in a much worse situation. It needed a much greater solution. And the love was great, far greater. It wasn't just two friends. It was the love like a father and a son. Greater even than that. Sometimes people say, well, is this kind of like a get out of jail free? Does it mean that we, we're just free to go off and do whatever we like because we can just be forgiven every time? Actually, it's the opposite, because can you imagine that person who's just had the, the penalty paid for him by his friend say, oh, great, well, I can go off and commit crime again. No, he'd say, I don't want to hurt my friend. In fact, it, it, it's, it's rather than being a, a reason to sin, it's an incentive not to sin. And then the power of sin has been broken. Jesus said, if the Son sets you free, if Jesus sets you free, you really will be free. My father had a terrible temper. And I had a terrible temper. I inherited it. And I thought, I'm, all the way through my life, I'm always going to have a terrible temper. That's just me. But when I encountered Jesus, 
the power of that was broken in my life. I was set free. But other things in my life, it's been a much longer process. There are many things I still struggle with. Justification, to use two theological words, justification happens instantly. You are put right with God. You're made righteous. There's no condemnation, no guilt. Sanctification, which is becoming like Jesus, that's a lifelong process. And then the pollution has been removed. There is continual forgiveness. John writes that the blood of Jesus cleanses us from all sin. This is so amazing. This is so wonderful. Forgiveness. And when we've experienced God's forgiveness, this is what I found. It made such a difference to my life. Because when you are forgiven, you want to forgive. Before I was a, a Christian, I, if someone offended me, I would hold a grudge against that person. But holding a grudge is like letting the other person live rent-free in your head. It doesn't do them any harm. And if someone offended me, I want to get back at them by not forgiving them. But unforgiveness doesn't hurt them, it hurts me, us. Someone said, unforgiveness is like kind of drinking poison and hoping the other person's going to die. And when we've experienced God's forgiveness, we, we want to forgive. And, and the hardest thing is to forgive ourselves. That's what I find the hardest. It's much easier for me to forgive other people than to forgive myself. But we have to forgive ourselves because otherwise, as C.S. Lewis pointed out, if God's forgiven us and we refuse to forgive ourselves, it's like setting ourselves up as a higher tribunal than God. God forgives you. Forgive yourself. And we forgive others because we have been forgiven so much. Forgiveness is a choice. But it's not optional. It's really hard. C.S. Lewis said, everyone thinks forgiveness is a lovely idea until they have something to forgive. And then it's really hard. But it really is true. The first to apologize is the bravest. The first to forgive is the strongest. And the first to forget is the happiest. Total unlimited forgiveness transforms all our relationships, transforms marriage, family life, friendships. One of my spiritual heroes is a woman called Corrie ten Boom, amazing Dutch Christian, who during the war hid Jews from the Nazis. And she was caught and arrested, as was her father and her sister. And they were taken to concentration camps. Her father died, and her sister Betsy, who went with her to Ravensbrück, died also in that concentration camp. But amazingly, Corrie survived. And after the war, she went around just talking about forgiveness, this message of forgiveness. One time in 1947, she was in a church in Munich. And when she finished her talk, this man came up to her. And she recognized him as one of the guards in Ravensbrück concentration camp. He didn't recognize her, but she recognized him. And she could remember his cruelty. And he came up to her and he said, thank you for your message, wonderful message about forgiveness. I have become a Christian and I know that God has forgiven me. I want to know that you forgive me. And he stuck out his hand and said, shake my hand as a sign that you've forgiven me. And Corey said, she just, all the memories of her sister dying, his cruelty came back into her head. She wrote this, I stood there and I could not. Betsy had died in that place. Could he erase her slow, terrible death simply for the asking? It could not have been many seconds that he stood there, hand held out. But to me, it seemed hours as I wrestled with the most difficult thing I'd ever had to do. I stood there 
with the coldness clutching my heart. But forgiveness is not an emotion. I knew that too. Forgiveness is an act of the will, and the will can function regardless of the temperature of the heart. Jesus, help me, I prayed silently. I can lift my hand. I can do that much. You supply the feeling. And so, woodenly, mechanically, I thrust my hand into the one stretched out to me. And as I did, an incredible thing took place. The current started in my shoulder, raced down my arm, sprang into our joined hands, and then this healing warmth seemed to flood my whole being, bringing tears to my eyes. I forgive you, brother, I cried, with all my heart. For a long moment, we grasped each other's hands, the former guard and the former prisoner. I have never known God's love so intensely as I did then. God loves you intensely. You are loved. The Son of God, Jesus, gave himself for you. He loved you and he gave himself for you. When I understood that, it totally changed my life. And it's a gift. And it's a gift that you receive by faith. And that's what we're going to be looking at next week. What is faith? But you don't have to wait till next week if you want to respond, if you want to receive the gift. I'd love to give you a copy of this little booklet, Why Jesus. And in the back, there's a prayer that you can pray as a way of receiving that gift. But I want to leave you with those words. The Son of God loved me and gave himself for me.